Jesus wants us to do and then to teach. Not teach what we have not done. So we don't begin by teaching. We begin by doing. You can't go to a Bible school and spend three years there, get a degree, and think that you can now teach people if you have not done what Jesus has commanded in your own life. I remember asking a person once who graduated after a four-year Bible college course in a particular Bible college. He won the first prize in that uh, at the graduation ceremony where I was speaking. And he came to see me and I asked him, what is your spiritual condition at the end of these four years of study? Your inner life. He said, it's worse than when I first came. I'm more defeated by sin. He was honest. I said, now, you're going to go out with your degree and become a pastor somewhere. What are you going to teach people? Hebrew and Greek and uh, interpretations of various verses? Or are you going to teach them how to overcome the lust of the eyes? How to overcome anger? That's what they need to hear because that's what Jesus taught. And if you haven't experienced that overcoming in your own life, what are you going to teach? Theory. This is the sad state of so many preachers and pastors. And that's why you hear every now and then of some famous preacher or pastor who's been preaching for many years. Suddenly you discover he's been living in adultery for so many years. How is it that the people in the congregation could not discern the impurity in this man's spirit? Because they were taken up by the eloquence of his preaching and the knowledge that he had. Jesus said, teach them to do what I commanded. Now I want you to turn to Acts chapter 1 verse 1 and see Jesus' own example. Acts was written by Luke, the co-worker of Paul. And before he wrote Acts of the Apostles, he wrote Luke's Gospel. And there, in Acts of the Apostles, he refers to the Gospel of Luke that he had written in these words. He wrote both of them to a person called Theophilus. And he says, the first account I composed, O Theophilus, which is the Gospel of Luke, which we know as the Gospel of Luke, was about all that Jesus began to do and teach. So if you were to ask Luke to give a title to his Gospel, he would say, all that Jesus began to do and teach. Not all that Jesus taught, but what he did and taught. It was a principle in Jesus' life that he would not teach what he hadn't done. It's more than that involved in this sentence, because it refers to his actions and his miracles and all that. But the principle is this, do and then teach. Not teach and do, but do and teach. Jesus did not practice what he preached, but he preached what he had already practiced and continued to practice. So that's the principle. So based on that, if you were to ask Luke to give a title to the Acts of the Apostles, based on that one verse, what title do you think he would give? If the Gospel of Luke was all that Jesus began to do and teach in his physical body on earth, Acts of the Apostles would be all that Jesus continued to do and teach through his spiritual body, the church. And that is our ministry. To continue, for Jesus to continue to do and teach what he began to do and teach when he lived on earth for 33 years. That's why the church is called the body of Jesus Christ. That's why to understand all that Jesus taught is important because we got to do it and then we got to teach it. There's a very interesting incident in Acts of the Apostles chapter 10 where we read that there was a very God-fearing military man who was a heathen, not a Christian. He was not even a Jew. He was a Roman soldier called Cornelius. 
He was a centurion, means he was a certain high-ranking officer in the Roman army. And he was a God-fearing man, a man who feared God, it says, a devout man, a man who gave many alms to the people. He helped poor people and he prayed to God continually. Now the question comes, does God listen to the prayers of people who are not Christians? Does God look at the money that non-Christians give to poor people? Well, have a look here. The angel came and said to him, an angel, God sent an angel to Cornelius. And he said to him in verse 4, your prayers have ascended as a memorial before God. And the money you have given to the poor, the arms, have also ascended as a memorial before God. Isn't that interesting? And when Peter saw Cornelius later on, he says, there's one thing I've discovered, Peter says, that with God there is no respect of persons. He later on says in the same chapter. But the point I want you to notice here is when the angel came to Cornelius, why didn't he give him the gospel? Why didn't he explain to Peter, uh, to Cornelius, sorry, that do you know that you're a sinner, that Christ died for your sins and rose again, and you need to receive him as your Lord, repent and believe? He couldn't say that. All that the angel could tell him was, your prayers and arms have ascended, and now please send somebody to go and call, verse 5, Acts 10, 5, for Peter. He's living far away in uh, another place, and in Joppa. Send somebody. It may take a few days for Peter to come here, but you got to wait. And the angel then departed. Now, don't you think the angel could have told him exactly what Peter would tell Cornelius? The angel knew the gospel very clearly. Why didn't Almighty God allow the angel to preach the gospel to Cornelius? This is a very important question. Why did Cornelius have to wait for so many days to hear the gospel till Peter came? Because the angel had not experienced the gospel. He could not say like Peter, I was a sinner, but Jesus died for me and his blood cleansed my sin and I am forgiven. Because the angel could not say that, he could not preach it. He could not preach a truth that he knew. He could probably preach better than Peter. It doesn't matter. He is not allowed to preach it because he hadn't experienced it, teaching us one fundamental principle that we are not permitted by God to preach what we have not experienced. There's a word for people who do that, those who preach what they have not practiced or experienced, and the word in the New Testament is hypocrite. And there are many hypocritical preachers. So when Jesus said in this Great Commission, teach them to do all that I've commanded you, he was telling us to be free from hypocrisy. He was telling us never to speak about that which we haven't done. For example, if you have not gone to North India as a missionary, you can't ask other people to go there as missionaries, can you? Well, you can teach it, but you haven't done it. It's very necessary, very important. Well, who's got the right to teach it? The one who's done it. That's just one example and applies in many, many other areas of life. We must be willing to humble ourselves and recognize that God has got many people in the body of Christ to preach various things, and I may not be called to preach everything. I can only preach what I have done. I cannot teach people to overcome anger, to give up anger if I'm still getting angry with myself, with my wife or co-workers or whatever it is. I, I cannot ask people to overcome dirty thoughts, sexual thoughts, if I'm still defeated by it myself. I can say, hey, fellas, I'm defeated, but let's you and I struggle together. That's fine. But I must be honest. So teach them to do. 
Now let's turn back to Matthew chapter 4. We were looking at the first thing that Jesus commanded there was to learn to receive God's word. One of the first things we need to learn as newborn babes, man shall not live by bread alone, Matthew 4.4, 4, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. In 1 Peter and chapter 2, we read that in verse 2, that like newborn babes, we must desire the pure milk of the word of God. As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word of God. It's just like any newborn baby, if it's normal and healthy, as soon as it's born, it cries out. And throughout, the, from the very first day onwards, for a number of days and weeks and months, it keeps on crying out. And what's it crying out for? Milk. Nobody has to teach that newborn baby to cry for milk. If it's a sick child, it will not cry. And unfortunately, we have a lot of sick babies in Christendom. If you've had a healthy new birth, a proper new birth, and you're born as a healthy, spiritually healthy child of God, I want to tell you that nobody will have to teach you to cry out for the milk of the Word of God. I remember in my own life when... I was born again 52 years ago. I found within me a tremendous cry for the milk of the word of God. I was too young to eat the meat, which is also found in this book, but I could receive the milk. And this is the very first thing that characterizes any genuinely born again child of God. And so. If you claim to be born again and you have absolutely no desire uh, for the milk of God's word, I would ask you to question whether you're really born again. Every healthy baby cries out for milk all over the world, in every nation, in every place. In all centuries it's been like that. And so it is with where there's a genuine new birth, there's a longing to receive God's word, to hear what God has to say to me. Even if I don't have a Bible, to hear what God has to say to me to hear his word. 